Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. As we power up for gardening season, we learn more about battery operated tools. I'm getting some veggies growing in our hoop house. I'll be sharing details about this year's backyard garden contest. And finally, before we plant up our containers, we discuss the proper way to clean them first. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. So if you're looking for an easy, low maintenance perennial, have two different types of flowers on one plant. Face noise that gives the pepper its heat. Today we are on OSU's campus in the formal gardens and joining me today is John Lee who is the director of landscape services. John, it looks like you pulled out the whole tool shed for us. Tell you, us a little bit about what we've got here. You're right. We did we did empty our tool shed. <laughs> what you're looking at is several different platforms of battery operated equipment that we have begun our process of transitioning from gas to battery. Okay. And so we're trying all kinds of different, you, different brands, different styles, types, weights, uh, amp hours of batteries to see which one's gonna work the best for us. Okay, well, before we get into which one maybe is the winner or not, <laughs> tell us a little bit about why you're even doing this. What about battery operated tools is better? Well, there's actually three key components that I like to remind the team and get feedback from our team, noise, uh -huh. emissions, and user friendliness. Okay. So the first one being noise, as you can see, we have a very high traffic circulation. You got of, a few people in your A lot garden. of pedestrian <laughs> traffic. So when you've got your PPE on, you got your headphones, your earplugs in, and you're using gas operated uh -huh. equipment, which can get up to 94 decibels. And they don't have PPE on when they're walking past and you. And they don't. Right. So they're not only hearing that, but you can't really hear them. Right. So a bike, a scooter passing by, you, your, your situational awareness is a little bit different compared to the battery operated. Uh, we have a team member mowing right behind us and you would be hard pressed to hear the all of that going on. Yeah, normally we would have to tell somebody mowing to, right, stop, to stop so we can do our audio here. Exactly. So that's one of the key noise benefits of battery operated equipment. So it's really a safety thing when it comes down to it like it, that. It can be. Yeah. It, you've increased the situational awareness for the staff. So mm -hmm. they're not having to wear that ear protection that they would of a of a gas operated. These range about 74 decibels. Okay. So they could actually hear a bike approaching and their situational awareness is much better. Right. They don't get to hear the equipment that they're holding for hours on end, <laughs> the, the vibration, and that takes a toll on a, yeah, on a staff. Yeah, absolutely. Just on your joints and everything sure, too. Sure, yeah, so the, holding the, the vibration, the running, the, the engine that's running, so. So let's talk about the maintenance. I would assume the maintenance might be less with the battery operated versus you assume, the gas You assume the correct. <laughs> That's right. So this is a grab your battery and go. Okay. Uh, proper planning, charging the night before, grab it, plug it in, it's ready. Gas operated, you're mixing oil, you're hauling fuel, um, you're winterizing, you're mm. stabilizing your fuel in the winter. There's no winterization practices for our battery operated. We just keep them sharp and clean just like we have to do with our gas. I like low maintenance tools. Low maintenance, <laughs> we like low maintenance yeah. period, right? So they've been working really well. It's even more It's even more beneficial when we're working really in close proximity to a classroom oh. or lecture hall. Mm -hmm. We don't have to stop. We can continue pruning or shearing or blowing a hardscape, even mowing and not disturb a, a classroom or lecture hall. Blowers, two stroke engines, they're noisy. Right, right. So. Okay, and then what was it? the third point was Emi operator? The, a little emissions, bit emissions. Yes. I don't want to skip emissions. Yeah, emissions. So battery operated, there's, I mean, directly there's no emissions out in the field. Yeah. Now you can imagine the 
the emissions coming from a two-stroke engine. Well, the heat also, and this goes into the user friendliness and um, the operation of a two-stroke or gas operated, you've got the heat reflecting, you've got the heat that we have to be really careful about next to certain shrubs and ornamentals. Mm -hmm. well, when you're pruning or shearing for long periods of time, that exhaust heat can damage your plant material. Mm -hmm. So you've gotta be very cautious about that. We just don't have that with our battery operated. And the user is not absorbing any of that emissions or heat. Right. So there's some user friendliness too. So when you're going down long hedgerows like we have right. behind us here. <laughs> That's right, exactly. You just keep going. Yeah. And we're not concerned about the heat damage like we would be with a two-stroke engine where you're holding that piece of equipment, whether the exhaust could, could damage plant material. Okay. They're lighter. They really are lighter. Um, even with some of the smaller um, handheld equipment, they, help, they, they pack a big battery. It's still lighter compared to a gasoline engine full of fuel. Mm -hmm. So what about like, um, you've got several different tools or brands here and you know, we're not necessarily promoting one or right. the other, but can you tell us like pros and cons of maybe some of the different lines that you've found? I sure can. So we have really gravitated more towards this Ego brand okay. as a rigid durability, more of a commercial grade. We're using it at an institution mm -hmm. daily. Uh, the, the team was a little off kilter when I said, I need to borrow your equipment. I mean, this is what they use every day. Uh -huh. So Ego has been the platform that we're leaning more towards just in durability. The batteries uh, have a longer life, a longer work amp hour okay. life to them. Maintain really well, charge very easily. Connections are very sturdy and robust. The lightest, probably the lightest equipment we could buy is the Dewalt. It mm -hmm. seems to be the lightest handheld equipment. Works very well. They just, they're always gravitating more towards the ego. And we, I was thinking if you have Dewalt tools, like you might already have those batteries. Absolutely, so. if you already have your, all your drill guns and all these other power tools, right. it's the, this platform supports that battery platform. Right. So that's very handy. We even have a handheld power washer. Oh wow, that, okay. Yeah, so they make a lot of very unique tools that can support the battery system you may already have. Mm -hmm. uh, steel, we love steel equipment. We use a lot of it. Uh, we have some favorites parts of the steel equipment and they'll grab that tool for a certain job out in the field. Uh, Husqvarna the same. There's a certain cut that we like with the Husqvarna. So we're really, we're really experimenting yeah. before we make our commitment but to switch over to one single platform. Okay, well, so tell us a little bit about the power though, because I think that's what ultimately we would get to is like, are you seeing any reduction in the ability to trim or the actual uh, you know, power behind those batteries compared to a gas power? Great question. Maintaining often. So not only maintaining your battery often with making sure it's fully charged, but also maintaining your landscape often mm -hmm. too. So we're not allowing our landscape to get out of hand where it's going to take something very powerful to rejuvenation, prune, or even your maintenance level pruning during the growing season. So they're doing a good job. Okay. And po power to power, the gasoline is more powerful. Okay. Um, the short answer is yes, it is more powerful. We have been able to continue to maintain campus with these platforms that you're looking at here. With no problem. With no problem. Okay, all right. And so next question is cost. Are these more expensive or less expensive? Where, where does the, that lie? Right, that's a great question. And that really varies on which platform or brand that you're, that you're leaning towards and the robust, the commercial grade of that brand or residential grade of that brand. The initial investment is more yes. So you would always wanna have a battery or two spare that's on the charger uh -huh. so that you're not caught in the middle of, of a maintenance item and you don't have the power to finish. So investing in those extra batteries is, that's recommended and we do that. So yes, the initial purchase of the equipment, few extra batteries, it can get pretty expensive. But then keeping um, in mind, you're not having the maintenance and the labor and the gas and the oil right. and, and filters, right? That's right, and the emissions yeah. and the noise. Yeah. And I mean, it really is grab your battery, plug it in and go. Okay. Um, you're not mixing the fuel. You're not carrying the fuel and purchasing the fuel. Right. So you're kind of doing all that on the front side. So yes, you would see a cost variation that depending on the, the different platform, okay. could be more expensive. So how are y'all making that actually work? What happens when you're out here 
it's nice to have a gas can, but my battery's dead. Now I got to go all the way back and charge the battery. What, I have you're to right. take a break. Yeah, you're right. Force break. <laughs> the, the, equi the equipment forces our breaks, right? It's planning. So mm -hmm. need to be prepared, making sure that you have those extra batteries that are charged up, ready to go in your truck or, or gator, ready to, ready to plug in and continue your work. Now, because that's just acting like the fuel can, you have your extra fuel source mm -hmm. being those batteries ready to go. It's proper planning. Uh, we do have an exciting platform that I'm trying to get organized and that's having a charging station on a trailer that houses all of our battery equipment on chargers, charging while the trailer's parked because the solar panels on oh, top. Okay. So we're, we would capture some solar energy, transfer that into some deep cell batteries and continue to charge our batteries throughout the day. So tell us a little bit about that planning project you've got going on. Well, we have the trailer uh -huh. and we are crowdfunding for some uh, donations and donor support to buy some solar panels and invest in our batteries and then expand our fleet of battery operated equipment. So we're doing that through uh, Philanthropy with the OSU Foundation. We're very excited about that process and look forward to growing our battery operated footprint and transitioning more on campus. Right now we're doing this mainly in the core of campus. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for sharing this endeavor with us. And I know homeowners have learned a lot from your experience. I here, hope so. And I look forward to seeing all of that on campus as well. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Okay. For more information about OSU's flipping the switch to a brighter orange, check out this website. houses have become quite popular over the last few decades and there's a little bit I want to share with you about what a hoop house is and how it's different than a greenhouse. So a hoop house is similar in the fact that it's able to capture heat. However, it's different in the fact that you don't need any energy source for a hoop house. As you can see, this hoop house is completely freestanding. So it's nice because you don't have to have it near any sort of energy source such as electricity or gas so that allows you some flexibility as to where you put those on your property so because we can't just adjust a thermostat and control the heat in a hoop house we have to do other means um, in order to sort of regulate those temperatures a little bit and mainly we do that by opening and closing the hoop house so for this particular smaller hobby hoop house that means opening the doors and then also we have a vent here in the center that actually pulls back and allows for that heat in the center to escape as well Different hoop houses are designed differently, so you might find that they have different openings. But basically what we're doing is capturing that solar heat during the hottest part of the day, which allows it to warm up. If it gets too hot, say we do have some of those early spring days that still get into high 70s and 80s, which means this gets even warmer in here. What we're gonna do is then open the doors, open that event and allow some of that heat to escape also. This basically allows for us to extend the growing season, meaning we can grow plants longer into the fall months and also start plants earlier in the spring because it will warm up in here earlier. So you can see we've got some cool season crops that we've been growing throughout um, the last few months and actually we need to start pulling those out because some of our uh, spinach is starting to bolt already. However, it's still a good month before we're planting warm season crops outside, but we're gonna go ahead and start some transplants inside here. Now, we're doing it a little bit different. Most hoop houses are typically over just soil and they're, grown, um, they're growing their plants in the ground. So that can be beneficial because you're getting that natural uh, geothermal heat from the ground to kind of uh, protect those plants even more. We are growing in containers here. So the nice thing about this is as the temperatures warm up, I can pull these tomatoes out and just grow those out in the containers into the garden. Unfortunately, that does expose the whole root a little bit more to that ambient air if it does get cooler in here. So knowing that we might still get a little bit cooler in here and I might still have to put another layer of protection over these tomatoes, even though they are in a hoop house, because again, we can't necessarily regulate it as well as we can a greenhouse. 
but I think we're getting closer. In fact, right now it's 80 degrees in here, so it's nice and warm, even though it's still just 50 degrees outside. So we're gonna go ahead and get some of our tomato transplants started. I will say we planted uh, peppers in here and they grew just fine all season long in here and they thrived in that heat. Now, traditionally hoop houses are placed out in the field and the plants are planted directly into the soil. Um, and in those warmer months, what people will do is actually take the plastic off, allowing the frame to just be there. Um, and so the plants are then exposed to the traditional uh, weather that is just happening during that season. So that's the nice thing about hoop houses is they don't have the same expense as greenhouses do, but they still offer for you to grow some plants and extend that season. And so we are going to utilize ours to go ahead and extend our season and get some container vegetables growing a little sooner. Every gardener has a story about how they got interested in gardening originally, and I'm no different. Growing up in rural Creek County, I enjoyed playing outside. And in fact, being in rural farm area, I enjoyed exploring the ponds and the creeks with my brother, because honestly, that was just the coolest place to be in August. Now, what really fascinated me is as I started looking at the shallow water areas, seeing the tadpoles and frogs and the dragonflies dance along the surface of the water. When I was about 10 years old, I convinced my dad to move an old steel bathtub that we had in the barn out into the backyard. And I started filling it up with water and plants that I found growing around those farm ponds. And so this past winter, when we started thinking about our Oklahoma Gardening Backyard Garden Contest, I thought, what better thing to feature than the water garden? We are announcing our Oklahoma Backyard Contest for 2023, and we want to see your water gardens. We would like for you to enter those entries between now and April 30th. And you can do so by emailing five to 10 photos along with a short description of your water garden. Now, of course, it's very early in the season and most water gardens are still just waking up. So if you have older photos that still are a good representation of your water garden, feel free to use and send those photos also. In May, we will post some of those top entries onto our Facebook page where you, the audience, will be able to vote on which water gardens we go visit. Then we'll schedule with the homeowners to go visit those water gardens and shoot a special episode of Oklahoma Gardening that will air later this season. So when the heat cranks up this summer, I hope to be able to come visit your water garden. So get those entries in by April 30th. Gardening can be expensive. And if you're like me, a lot of times you get different plastic pots given to you, or perhaps you have some other pots. Now, if you have these plastic pots, the problem with them is they are typically not recyclable in those single stream recycling uh, bins that a lot of communities offer, or very few recycling centers actually will take some of these plastic um, containers. And so one way to both save money and help reuse some of these plastic containers is to use them up again next season by planting up some of your transplants. Now, before we plant anything in those or our spring containers, before we get them ready, of course, if your containers still look like this from last fall when you had something in there, you can see that there's still a lot of residue in there from the soil and the plant material. Um, and it's not just about what we can actually see, but it's about what we can't see because all of this can harbor different bacteria and fungus that can cause potential diseases on our new plants that we're planting in there. So before we reuse any containers, we wanna make sure that we're getting our plants off to the right start. Now, there is one other thing that you might often see on um, containers, and that is this white buildup. This is mineralization. Often it's salt that gets built up, just like what might build up on sometimes your sinks and your faucets with the hard water. And so you'll see this kind of build up. Now, the first thing to do with these containers in order to get them 
clean is to go in there with either just a kitchen scrub brush that might work on some things that are smaller and just have a little bit of debris um, or for something that's a little bit larger say a clay pot what you're going to do is really get in there and scrub it with a wire brush or also still wire will work as well now you can use some water to kind of do that you might use a brush so just typically what you're going to do now i know i'm a gardener and typically i go out to the garden so that i don't have to do dishes and house chores but i promise this isn't too much um, hard work and it's well worth the investment so that your plants are successful now typically there's two different types of pots that you might have and your plastic or your glazed ceramic pots they are typically not porous. Um, and so you really just need to make sure you're getting that debris out with again, some sort of brush or a rag, wiping that down at both the inside and the outside. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the next step. But on the clay pots, what you're going to do is probably have a lot more salt buildup. And that salt buildup is not just gonna be at the rim. Because it's porous, you will see that there's a lot of that white mineralization happening um, both on in the inside and the outside down the profile of that container. So really get in there and kind of scrub that white um, uh, salt off so that we don't have that on there for the next season. Because what can happen is if you put a plant in here and it trails over anywhere where that salt is in contact with those stems, it can actually cause some desiccation and prevent those, those stems from continuing to grow. So we wanna make sure we get our plants off to the right start. So once you have your container fairly well scrubbed of those salts, and I will say a wire brush kind of works better on some of your clay pots, um, and this steel wool or rag often works better on your smooth uh, plastic containers. So when you get the debris knocked off, what you're then gonna do is work up and make up a solution of bleach. And really that recipe or the ratio is one parts bleach to nine parts water. So you're gonna have a 10% bleach solution that you're creating. And that will help sanitize these pots further. So if you do, I mean, obviously I couldn't get all of um, the buildup off of these clay pots because they're a little bit older. Um, but if you do leave some of that residue, that bleach solution will then help sanitize it and kill any bacteria or pathogens that might still be on there. So we're gonna work this up um, and go ahead and make up our solution and then pour that into our water. So once we have our bleach solution in there, we're gonna go ahead and put our clay pots um, around. And like I said, I like to make a big batch of this um, so that I can go ahead and put a lot of pots in at once. We've got something a little bit deeper here. Um, and I'm just gonna allow that to soak in there. So you wanna let your pots soak for 10 minutes in this bleach solution. And if you don't quite have the water level high enough to cover them, you might rotate them periodically through that so that they do completely get bleached. And remember, you're working with bleach. So make sure that you're wearing protective gloves and also old clothes in case there is any splashing or anything like that. You wanna be cautious of that as well. Now, after we let these soak for about 10 minutes, the next step that we're gonna do is then go and rinse that bleach solution off of these. So just go get another garden bucket or um, take them outside and then rinse them with some dish soap um, and that will just clean off that bleach and then they should be ready to go and be planted. Now, a little tip though, if you're going to be planting your clay pots soon, go ahead and leave your clay pots in that rinse water for a little while and allow them to kind of soak up and become a moist, completely saturated with water, um, clean water, of course, because if you're gonna plant those soon and you actually let those clay pots dry out, when you do pot them up with potting soil and new plants, then they're actually gonna wick away some of that moisture from that potting soil and that new plants. So after you have all of your pots and containers sterilized, because you have bleach water already mixed up, go ahead and utilize it to clean some of your other garden tools as well. Now, I know I mentioned last week using Lysol on some of your hand pruners and things when you're out pruning, and that Lysol is a really great way to do that when you're out in the field, but there's no reason why you can't go ahead and use this bleach solution to clean not only your hand tools, but also your shovels and saws and things like that to get them uh, started this season as well. Now, I did mention Lysol works on hand tools. It has not really been shown. Um, there's not a lot of evidence to show how effective it is on uh, 
uh, killing plant pathogens in containers and on containers. So that's why it's still preferred to use the bleach solution to sanitize your pots. After you finish sanitizing all of your pots and your garden tools, what do you do with all of this bleach water still? Well, another tip to go ahead and utilize it while you have it might be to go ahead and scrub the greenhouse floor so that you can get rid of any mold. Or another option would be to go and take it and utilize it if you have any moldy areas on your patio or your driveway to go ahead and scrub that as well. But finally, really in order to get rid of this, the solution is to dilute it. So take it out away from your landscape and continue adding water. And so you really dilute it to an um, unharmful level at that point. Bleaching and sanitizing your pots is a great way to get your plants off to a healthy start this season. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. You won't want to miss Oklahoma Gardening next week as things are beginning to break ground. Great um, option, option? What am I trying to say? Great use of it? To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticulture Society, the Tulsa Garden Club, and the Tulsa Garden Center.